Hello, I'm David Breeden. I'm the Senior Minister at First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis, a historically humanist congregation, and this is Coffee and Wisdom. This past week, we have been looking at process philosophy and theology, and been, we've been talking about the many aspects of this from all the way back until the present and what it's doing nowadays. We've run into a lot of P's here, process philosophy, process theology, panpsychism, pan theism or pan deism, according to who you're asking, but they sort of mean the same thing, and pan entheism. So process philosophy is the oldest coming from Whitehead, then process theology coming out of that, and then some ideas that have been added in since they uh, process theology started with panpsychism, pantheism, and panentheism. So let's head off into those P's today, shall we? First off, uh, it all begins with Alfred North Whitehead's Process and Reality, published in 1929 from lecture notes that he gave at Harvard um, at, at, during those uh, between 25 and 29. One of his students, as a matter of fact, a, a graduate assistant was Charles Hartshorn, 1897 to 2000. Now, Hartshorn is the one who brings the process philosophy into process theology for the first time. From 1923 to 25, he studied in Europe. He was a student of Edmund Husserl, who have we, we have discussed as a phenomenologist, Barton Heidegger, and then he was a research fellow at Harvard, 1925 to 28. This is the time that Alfred North Whitehead was giving the lectures that would become the book. And then he became a professor of philosophy at the University of Chicago, 1928 to 1955, and from there affected a lot of liberal religious uh, future leaders uh, teaching in the divinity school there. So we need to look just a minute, though, because that's all a long time ago. Let's think about where we are today. So this is a recent uh, writing from John S. Feinberg, Chair of Prof uh, and Professor of Systemic Theology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, just north of um, of uh, uh, Chicago. So systematic theology is uh, where we try to develop systems of theology that all sort of logically fit together uh, as so that we can uh, talk about reality, usually having something to do with the theistic bent. So he says, stemming initially from Alfred North Whitehead's Process and Reality, 1929, process theology has gained widespread interest and acceptance among non-evangelical scholars in the latter half of the 20th century. Process theology, he's going to define it for us, sees all existing things, including God, as dipolar actual entities. I'll get back to that. Each actual entity has a primordial pole, which contains all the possible things that an entity can become, and an actual pole, the physical thing in the world that the actual entity is. The process God is finite, mutable, less than omnipotent, and via his physical pole, suffers alongside of his creatures. This is not thought to be a defect, but rather an asset, as it allows God to identify with his creatures and experience what, experience what happens to them as it happens. Okay, that's a lot to say, but what is this dipolar thing? Well, there really are dipolar substances out there. It's especially uh, true in chemistry. In theology, it means that there are these dipolar things that are set up that describe or don't describe God. So over on the right-hand side here, we have the what, what uh, uh, the professor is calling the, the primordial elements, those things that are possible, but and then on the left-hand side, those things that are uh, right now happening. All right, so that's the dipolar nature of theism. So we've got infinite. Now, you know, uh, most Christian theology for most of Christian history have talked about God as infinite, necessary, eternal, omnipotent, all-powerful, and absolute. Now we're going to talk about God from a process theological view as finite, contingent, mutable, less than omnipotent, and relative. Okay, so you get me so far. This is how the process theologians are going to talk about God. God is part of the process and is going toward or 
becoming all of those great things we've talked about uh, from the past, but isn't there yet. That's part of the idea. All right. So there are a lot of books about this. Uh, you can you know, just do a search and off you go. Go to your local bookstore. A History of the Concept of God, a Process Approach. There you have it. Uh, process Theology and Celtic Wisdom. Uh, so there you have it if you're interested in that. Uh, the Mind of God, The Scientific Basis for a Rational World by Paul Davies. You'll notice that this is a New York Times notable book of the year. Uh, he also, uh, Mr. Davies also wrote uh, God and the New Physics and About Time. So again, the process theology uh, aspect of this is where many theologians are coming up with the idea of how God fits into uh, newer concepts uh, within the scientific world, usually um, having something to do with quantum mechanics, as a matter of fact. Uh, process of Theology, a Guide for the Perplexed, and you can even get it for your kids, Piglet's Process, Process Theology for All God's Children. So the books are out there uh, to enjoy. Um, I should mention a, a, a particular scholar here, Catherine Keller, uh, one of her books is On the Mystery, Discerning Divinity in Process. Uh, it is looking at the idea of uh, process theology from a feminist ecological viewpoint. Uh, there's a book about her, A Process Theology of Hope, The Counter-Apocalypse Vision of Catherine Keller by Brian McCallan. Uh, Catherine Keller is a contemporary Christian uh, theologian, professor of constructive theology at Drew University's Graduate Division of Religion, and she's a constructive theologian. That's a newer term that means that she believes that we are continually constructing our theologies out of the uh, uh, out of the various things that can come up. It's a process, and it changes over time. But her work is oriented towards social and ecological justice, post-structuralist theory, post-structuralist, of course, going back to that continental uh, philosophy that we've been talking quite a bit about, and feminist readings of scripture and theology. So it's out there. It's contemporary. It is what the ministers of tomorrow are now studying uh, in theology school. But wait, as I mentioned yesterday, some people say, I don't want all of that possibility stuff. I want my religion and my God to be true and provable. So is there any way to get out of this endless process discussion and get at truth, what's real and out there? Well, one question that, that, that some people think lead in that direction is, do bananas have souls? Do bananas have souls? Or at least, do they have a consciousness? Um, and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz uh, uh, believed that they did. He uh, produced a book in 1714 called Monodo <laughs> Monadology, actually. The, what he's talking about monads, what nowadays we would call atoms. Atoms was a word uh, developed way back uh, in ancient Greek days, uh, disappeared for quite a while. Um, uh, Leibniz needed to call them something, so he called them monads. Uh, and nowadays we call those things atoms. But this, the little tiny bits of reality out there and Leibniz said, Le Le Leibniz said. says that we um, we actually uh, have uh, something around us that has a consciousness, and, and that's where consciousness Ooh. comes from, because it does answer the question, how do we get conscious? From Oxford Bibliographies, um, panpsychism is currently experiencing something of a revival and is once again the subject of serious philosophical debate. Its strength largely der derives from the implausibility of the emergence of mind from non-mental reality. And so you're going to see a lot of books out there right now, like this one, Panpsychism, Past and Recent Selected Readings. It's a hot topic at the moment. Does the entire universe have a consciousness? Consciousness. The question and answers is, where does consciousness come from? It seems like an amazing thing to have consciousness. Can it just come out of material reality? And that is an open question. 
Oxford uh, bibliography goes on to say, broadly speaking, panpsychism is the view that everything has a mind or at least some mind-like quality or aspect. And we're going to see right here Henri Bergson over on the right and Whitehead and a diagram uh, describing the space-time co continuum uh, that Einstein uh, creates with his mathematical formulas. So uh, really, uh, process philosophy is coming out of this new idea of relativity. Uh, Henri Bergson is still read today. You can find lots of books about him. Catherine Keller that I mentioned a, a few slides ago uh, is an author who uh, very much likes Bergson uh, and uh, has written a book about him. Uh, Creative Evolution is probably his best known book and continues to be read uh, to this day. He said, for a conscious being to exist is to change. To change is to mature. To mature is to go on creating oneself endlessly. So that describes a process. If you're interested in process theology, there is indeed a Unitarian Universalist Process Theology Network. Uh, it invites uh, members to uh, explore process relational theology and thought. Uh, it's a not-for-profit organization that is affiliated with the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. They have meetings each year at our General Assembly, and they say the paradigm described by process theology is inclusive, dynamic, and ecological. All positive things uh, from that perspective. Now, I should mention one other thing about this, which is that there are really two aspects of process theology. Some people fall on one side of this and some on the other. Pantheism is saying that God is in everything. Panentheism says that everything is in God. Now, what the heck is the difference? Well, here's a handy dandy uh, little schematic for you. So good old-fashioned theism said that there was a universe, and you're there, human being, and there's a God who is outside and above the universe. That is traditional theism. Pantheism says that God and the universe are the same. Spinoza will make, will make that argument. It is an old animistic argument that that which we see in nature is holy is God or gods, usually in older pantheisms. Then panentheism, as you see, God is this huge thing that's actually uh, still, the, the universe is inside of God, but God still equals a whole lot more than that in panentheism. And then some would argue a process relational panentheism in which there, all we have is this infinite creativity that's going on. So lots of ways to read that. As a matter of fact, that last uh, schematic there, uh, you can uh, look into that by reading Divine Action and Emergence, an alternative to panentheism that is more about process theology uh, from a newer perspective. And this, again, goes on and on. Uh, and uh, nowadays, we're getting more into that idea of relationality within the process. And that's kind of the cutting edge of process theological thought at the moment. Thanks a whole lot for listening. I hope you uh, enjoyed something about this. If you're interested, there are lots more sources to go into. Uh, at First Unitarian Society in the month of March, we're going to be talking about commitment. And the Sunday at 1030 a.m. Central Standard Time, I'll be talking about the 10 commitments and how can I help. That's taking uh, in uh, to my talk the idea uh, something recent from the American Humanist Association, a takeoff of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commitments that um, humanists believe in, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that on Sunday. Thanks for joining us this week, and I'll be back next week with some more things to think about. Thank you. <laughs>